All right, coming up, we have Dependency and Infant Testing in Fedora by Adam Williamson. Take it away. Hi, folks. Uh, yeah, my name's Adam. I'm the team lead for the Fedora quality team at Red Hat, so I kind of look after, I tell people if Fedora's broken, it's my fault. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this since 2009 or so, so it's been a while, um, and I've seen Fedora through a lot of the changes that have happened to, um, I guess we're talking about automated testing in general, so I've been through the days of AutoQA, Taskatron, OpenQA, Fedora CI, Factory 2.0, you know, lots of stuff. So that all feeds into the background here. Um, yeah, just a quick note, I usually take questions at the end. I just find it works better that way, so if you have anything, sort of save it for the end unless it really needs to happen on the current slide. And get moving. So, start out, where, where do we stand with testing things in Fedora, let's say? It's just kind of a back, you know, level set of, leads into the ending here. What do we do right now? So some of the things we do when we're testing bits of Fedora, um, specifically packages for most of these. Um, we do an installability test. Uh, and we do a forward dependency test, RPM Deppelin. I'm going to refer to these quite often as generic CI tests. So if you build a package, you send the build of a package in Koji, the Fedora build system, or you send a pull request to a Fedora package, these tests will get run on it, probably. Um, you may never notice this happening, depending on the package in question, but it happens, believe me. Um, functionality testing right now is kind of you can set up testing for your package. Uh, it's a service that Fedora CI provides, so if you want to, you can sort of write some tests for your package and have them run when there's a package build, when there's a pull request, but you don't have to. Um, we have integration testing, which is the thing I mostly work on. We have a system called OpenQA, which uh, when there's a critical path update, it tests not, it's not testing the package as itself, it's testing does this package break the thing we call Fedora. So that's what that is. Um, and we do gating, which is you know actually caring about the results of the test, uh, which integration tests, the ones I just talked about, they always gate. So if your critical path package breaks one of those tests, it's not getting in. Um, the former three types of tests are gating is optional right now. We don't have distribution-wide gating on any of these tests. So if your package fails it, it's still going in unless you configured in your package repository to say you want the package gated on those tests. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of where we're up to right now. Um, there's an interesting ownership thing which I'll get to a bit more later in the talk, but the top three right now are more or less owned by the Fedora CI team. Uh, integration testing is owned by the Fedora quality team, i.e. me and Lukas, who's not here. Um, and gating is a bit fuzzy in that different teams own different bits of it, so that's gonna play into things later. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. This talk is mainly about, hey, what are some hard things that we are not doing but that we really should be? So what don't we do? Um, we don't do reverse dependency testing, which is a huge thing. If any of you know Martin Pitt, he is constantly on me about this, which is totally fair because it's a problem. Um, so reverse dependency testing is, you know, say, I don't know, everything depends on glibc. So when glibc changes, we should really test everything else and make sure if it broke. But we do not do that. If glibc passes its own tests, hey, on it goes. And I mean, there's the OpenQA integration tests, but there's various cases where those don't really apply. But we would still want, you know, do Python updates break Python packages, that kind of thing. And we just don't do that. Uh, as I said, gating for the you know, the CI, the generic CI tests and per package CI test is optional. There's, you know, you don't have to have your package gated and it would be way better if we could actually make it so that, yeah, you had to pass the installability test for your package to get in, but right now we don't for various reasons which I'll get into. Uh, Non-package input testing, this is another huge thing. Um, there's various things, like it's not just packages that go into, you know, Fedora when we, the things that we make and ship to users that we think of as Fedora. There are tons of inputs which are not packages. So what I call a manifest, we have things called, we have comps, which is where we define, you know, package groups. So the group of packages that is GNOME or the group of packages that is KDE are defined in this thing called comps. And when you make a change to comps, uh, we have a few sort of 
sanity tests, but there's no test that is this gonna break building images or whatever. We just merge it and then we do a compose and we see if it works, which is you know 1990s style software development. Um, there's various things that are similar to comps but aren't comps, which have come along in the last few years because of new build tools. Uh, so for instance, workstation OS tree config is a very, <laughs> that name is <laughs> very much out of date because the whole process has gone through about five main changes since then. But that's where the manifests of what we're currently calling atomic things live. So, you know, the packages that go in to make up, you know, an atomic workstation image or, an, you know, an atomic KD image or whatever, they live there. Uh, we have things called t what I'm calling templates, you know, recipes, whatever you want to call them, uh, which is more about, you know, okay, what's a recipe for building an image? Um, so we have the kickstarts is the most popular, you know, the oldest one of these. But we also have some new ones like the OS build recipes. Um, we have Fedora Kiwi templates, which is things we build with a build tool called Kiwi, which actually has tests, which is great. But most of these, again, we don't really have tests for. You know, if you want to change the kickstart, you send a pull request, me or Kevin looks at it, goes, yeah, I guess that looks okay. We merge it and then we wait and see if the compose fails. So there's that. Uh, package retirements is a really interesting one. Um, if you retire a package, that has, you know, various consequences. You probably shouldn't retire known shell. Uh, but again, we don't have anything that, hey, someone wants to retire a package, let's try, you know, doing stuff and see if it still works. We just go ahead and retire it and see what happens the next time there's a compose. You see a theme going here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, no, retirement's just, you know, you, you file a ticket, it gets retired. We do it on purpose sometimes. Uh, well, there's a whole thing, and then that package will get, a, you know, fail to build or fail to install bug against it, and then after a few weeks, that package will get retired. It's a whole thing. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm being replied, asked to repeat the question. The question was, can you retire a package that has dependencies? And the answer is yes, yes, you can do that. Um, I'm sorry, I should have looked at my notes earlier though, yeah. Yeah, just kind of like, why are these things important? And it's pretty obvious, like, we need reverse dependency testing to find if B, you know, if A does break B, we want to know about that when A changes. And ideally, you know, don't change A until B is fixed. If without reverse dependency testing, we only find out about it when we try and use B and go, oh, hey, B is broken. Mandatory gating, you know, testing without gating is pretty useless. This is, this is the thing we've worked out in the last 10, 15 years of software development. You know, when I first started at Red Hat in 2009, we were like, hey, automated testing, that's a great idea, let's do it. And then painfully we figured out tests are no use if the results don't mean anything. So without, ga you know, gating it should really be kind of table stakes for this stuff. Um, and non-package input testing, again, these are, as I said, you know, the theme, as I went through it, if we merge it and see if the compose breaks. So the consequence of it not working is the compose breaks, which is bad, we don't want that to happen. Uh, so, you know, this is bad. Why aren't we doing these things right now? Well, roadblocks. Um, so the generic CI tests, again, those are the, you know, installability, RPM, depth limit things. Um, that's where I've my thoughts here are most developed, honestly. Um, the reason we're not gating on those right now, accuracy is a huge one, which just means right now sometimes the tests are just wrong. Like you get failures of the installability test, like a classic example, um, right now your package will fail the installability test if it can't be downgraded, which is dumb because we don't care about that in Fedora, but uh, it's a requirement that came in from RHEL or something, and for stupid reasons we can't turn it off to Fedora. But yeah, and this is especially dumb because if the previous build of your package was broken and you send a build that fixes it so now it can be installed, that build fails the installability test because the old version of the package can't be installed, which is very dumb. And there's various silly things like that. So right now we can't gate on that test because the results just aren't always correct and there would be a massive uprising. RPM depth limit, um, RPM depth limit is the forward dependency test which you know checks if your package has dependency issues and it similarly has various cases where the result just is wrong. When the test runs the way it's intended to, you get a failure that you shouldn't get. Reliability, the system that the generic CI tests work in, Fedora CI, is, it's a, you know, it's there, it works most of the time. Sometimes it breaks, um, and I would, I don't wanna, you know, cause trouble for anyone, but I would say that we don't always respond to that sufficiently quickly. Um, like there was the time DNF5 landed and all the CI tests failed for a few days. 
and we need that to be, you know, half an hour, not a few days. Um, and just, you know, tests flake, and so in OpenQA, we auto retry every test once if it fails, just because sometimes tests flake, and we don't do that in CI, so if it flakes the first time, you have to retry it yourself, just stuff like that. Um, ease of investigation is the other big thing. If you get a test failure, you need to be able to figure out, well, okay, I have a test failure, what should I do about it? Um, and right now, that's not a great developer story. If you're a packager and you want to investigate an automated test failure, in some cases, it's not too bad. In other cases, you click on a link and then you have to know to click on a magic URL that's hidden within the log you see that takes you to the place where the real test results are and then you have to dig through five directories. It can get pretty ugly in the current system. So that kind of needs improving before we can, because you don't want to be gated on something that it's really hard for you to investigate why it's failing. Um, so that's kind of the reasons why we're not doing the, why we, we haven't been able to turn on test gating for those tests. For the reverse dependency testing area, these things are much more, you know, not developed yet. So the obvious big problem with that, we don't have a reverse dependency testing mechanism, it just doesn't exist. So we have to build one, that's the biggest thing we have to do. Um, and attribution is just, when you do that, you have to get the results out in a useful form. So we have to be able to communicate, okay, package A changed, so we ran package B's tests. And that information has to get to the right people in a form that's, you know, usable. So we have to figure that out as part of implementing it. Um, Non-package input testing, that's the stuff about testing comps and kickstarts and things. Again, we just have to plan it. We don't, it doesn't exist. There's a lot of questions. I'm gonna go into more detail on that on the later slide, so you know, stay tuned. But those are, that's a kind of summary of what we're gonna have to do for that one. Uh, okay, so how do we go about addressing these roadblocks, right? This is part of my talk here is like thoughts about how are we gonna get from here to there. Uh, so what are my ideas? So again, for the mandatory tests, you know, for mandatory gating on the generic test, this is the most developed of these three topic areas I'm talking about. So I kind of have a pretty, I hope a pretty solid plan. Part of this talk is just to tell you about it and see what you think about it. Um, so to me, the biggest problem we have here is like if you sit down and think about, hey, the installability test, it's not that reliable, it's, you know, it's not that accurate. We have all these problems with the results from it. RPM deplin, we have problems with the results from it. It's a huge problem area because there's tens of thousands of packages in Fedora and there can be all sorts of reasons why the results aren't correct. So my big thought here was let's try and narrow the focus. So I want to make it so that we have kind of, if you were in Matthew Miller's talk, like his ring naught or ring one idea, kind of define the set of packages where if there's something wrong with them, it's really important. Like we stop being able to produce Fedora and sort of cut that definition down. So I want to, we have this thing called the critical path generation script, which is the script that figures out what packages are in the critical path, which is kind of this, but not quite that. And I want to just extend that a bit so it also generates the list of packages that if they're wrong, compose is fail. That's my initial you know, definition. Um, and then we will have a much, hopefully much smaller set of packages, like maybe a couple of thousand packages where we can say, okay, for these packages, what are the issues with the generic tests? And if there's a problem outside of those packages, it's no longer such a big deal. So then once we have a more workable set of packages, my idea is, okay, let's go and look over the last year, two years of results for these packages and say, okay, are these tests failing a lot? Are they failing a little? Is there like consistent issues with the tests on those packages and try and work it down to the point where the tests are reliable enough on that specific set of packages that we can start gating them. That's, you know, that's the whole plan in a nutshell. Uh, yep. So that's, that was my plan for mandatory gating and we'll get to, you know, progress on it later. Stay tuned. Reverse dependency testing. This one is more notional and I, you know, I'm not planning to do all of this because it's a lot of trouble, but it's an issue that needs addressing and I have thoughts about how to do it at least. Um, so yeah, we need to design a way to do it and we need to make sure that we have enough capacity to do it because obviously testing everything that depends on Python when Python changes is a much bigger problem than just testing Python when Python changes. So that's a big issue. Um, and as I, I mentioned earlier, but we need to figure out 
right now, when you, you know, the, the way we track results from automated testing, just the formats we use don't really have a way of defining this is a test for package, 10 minutes thing, for package C because of package B, so we have to do that. Um, the gating mechanism thing, so this is another thing that Martin Pitt pointed out to me, is that especially if you start doing this, it, it's really bad if package A's tests are already broken, they're already failing, because then everything will be blocked, not because it actually breaks package A, but because package A's tests are bad. So if we had regression-based gating, that would address that, because in, what that means is you only gate the package if a test that was previously passing starts to fail because of that package. Right now, we don't have that. Like, it's, that's just not a policy you can define in Fedora's gating system. You can only define, we gate if the test fails. So that would be a thing that we may have to build in order to do this. Um, and the other recipe, you know, the other part of the holy trinity of testing for me, I said you need to have tests and you need to gate on them and then you need someone to care about the failures. That's the other part. If you don't have those three things, you don't have a practical system. So either we make it packages problems and that has to be accepted by you know the population of Fedora packages that you will have to resolve these or we have a task force or something. I don't have the answer, but that's a point that we have to consider. No? Oh, geez. I spoiled my slide. You didn't see that, don't worry. This is a very sensitive touch then. Uh, for non-package input testing, again, basically do everything is the plan. We have to identify all the inputs and then we have to decide. So this is something I was thinking about is do we try and onboard every single one of those repos separately? So I mean, there's, you know, there's maybe 10, 15 places where a change to this repo could break the compose. So do we make it so each of those has its own CI system that tries a compose and you know fails if it's broken? Or do we have a sort of central Compose testing service, which notices that any of these 10 inputs changed. Now I run some tests and see if, and then communicate the results back. Um, and we may have to enhance the Compose tools themselves to aid with that. Like one thing that I, that kind of frustrates me when I think about this is we don't really have a dry run mode for the Compose tools. Like it would be nice, like Pungy is the thing that actually builds all the images for Fedora. It does an actual Compose. You can only, actually do a compose. You can't run Pungy in a mode which says, okay, I'll take all the inputs, I'll resolve all the dependencies, I'll see if I hit any failures there, and then I'll just tell you, you know, what images I will build and what packages will be in them. You can't do that. It would be great if you could, because then you wouldn't have to wait eight hours to find out the result of your test. So that might be a nice thing to have. Uh, repo metadata overlay, that's mainly about retirements. Um, so when a package is retired, then in the next compose, that package disappears completely from the repository metadata. It's very hard to fake that state, like if it hasn't already happened, to take the existing, you know, rawhide, say, repository metadata and say, what would this look like if this package wasn't in it? That's another thing that obviously would make it much easier to test package retirements, and right now, as far as I'm aware, there's no way to do that, so that's a thing we might need. And if you were just in the Conflux talk, Dealing with this is complicated by the fact that this may all change hugely in a year or two. We may throw away everything I'm talking about here, Pungy, Koji, and it all becomes container pipelines. So the other thing you have to think about is do we want to put work into doing all of this if in fact we're going to change out the whole build system? But that's, you know, just another thing we have to consider. Uh, life is fun. Progress. So this, this was gonna be, you know, when an optimistic, naive Adam in spring pitched this talk, I thought I was gonna have some, especially on the first thing, you know, the, um, the, the generic CI test, I thought I was gonna have, you know, the script written and all of this, you know, maybe I have a list of all the problems of the test that we need to resolve. Uh, yeah, about that. That's our progress right now. Uh, stuff happened, you know, uh, so this is why I have several feeble excuses um, why I haven't done any of these things yet. Uh, people keep breaking stuff. It would be great if you all would just stop breaking stuff. Just throwing it out there would make my life so much easier. I went, went on vacation, had some great travels. It was awesome. Um, there were some shiny objects. I'm very easily distracted, it turns out. Um, I helped write a container publication script, which is nice, but not what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I did a bunch of Python 313 fixes. I've been super productive, just none of this stuff. And yeah, I mean, I don't want to throw the dog under the bus, but just throwing it out there, like, doesn't look good for the dog. Uh, <laughs> K 
kind of real excuses, yeah. So I alluded to this earlier, but there's a problem where the ownership of all this stuff is a little split and not really clear. There's the Fedora, the team that owns Fedora CI kind of owns some of this stuff. My team, Fedora Quality, theoretically owns some of this stuff, but, and the lack of prioritization part of it is, my manager is over here, Sadir, and he is not telling me I'll be fired if none of this is done. I don't believe any of the Fedora CI team, ah, I got it, thanks. <laughs> Possibly? He's, o he's under there along with my dog. Yeah, okay, one second. Um, and it's kind of the same with the team that is responsible for Fedora CI. I don't believe their managers are telling them if none of this happens, you get fired either. So there's, you know, it makes it difficult to work. These are obviously big problems that need quite a lot of work and we don't have that sort of driving factor that says it needs done last month. So that's kind of the real reason why it hasn't happened yet. But yeah, this is just the thing I like to do. If you've been looking at, no judgment, but some of you have been looking at TikTok for 20 minutes, I know it. So this is the, the summary slide. You can look up and pay attention now. Uh, yeah, we don't test everything. We should totally test everything. It's really hard. I wanted to whine about it, so thank you for listening to me. You're my support group. And it turns out I'm very easily distracted, so we've learned that. Glad we all learned together. Oh, sorry, were you taking a picture? Okay. And yeah, that was my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, questions and answers. Questions guaranteed. I'm not sure about the answers. Oh, sorry, can I run a, someone run a mic up here? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that too, whichever works. Excellent question. Have I spoken to Ralph before today? Yes, I love Ralph. Ralph is awesome. Do I know if Conflux is going to make life easier? No, but I hope it will. Um, the vision, so Conflux in case, you know, for anyone who doesn't have the background, is this new, it's a Tekton-based uh, image pipeline, basically. It's a new generation build system. All of the stuff I'm talking about here is very old tech. Some of it dates back to the 90s. Um, Conflux is hopefully a brand new shiny way which, you know, incorporates the last 20 years of software development practices. And if everything works out with Conflux, it would help a lot of this stuff massively, yes, because it fixes a lot of the background problems behind all of this stuff where it would just be natural that any kind of change to the build pipeline would be a pull request that you could just natively run tests on, stuff like that. We wouldn't have to build a bunch of things to solve these problems. The devil is always in the detail. Is Conflux gonna have sufficient resources behind it? Is a Fedora deployment of Conflux gonna have sufficient resources behind it? Are the timelines gonna be such that it helps us rather than causing us nightmares? I don't know the answers to all of that yet, but potentially it's a huge help, yeah. Any more questions? Tim? The tumbleweed gif. I was happy that worked, actually, because someone's gif didn't work earlier. <laughs> oh, I like that. Tim wants to know if this slide was subliminal messaging to promote Sue's tumbleweed. Definitely not. Yes, it was. <laughs> uh, two more minutes. Do we have any more questions? I'm just going to leave the tumbleweed up. It's yes, over here. Okay, so that was more of a note than a question, I guess. Yeah, so they've been thinking about using, possibly seeing if we can use Cache as a sort of mechanism to do the reverse dependency testing, which is an interesting idea for sure. Um, and we should think about it later. But yeah, honestly, my main focus in this talk was that stuff, and that was what I was hoping to get some work done on. But, you know, life happens. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about it later. Uh, any more, or are we good? Great, then thanks a lot for coming. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Enjoy Clock.